Welcome to another episode of The Grow Zone, everybody. I am Shawnee Henderson, and this is my genius husband. Keon Henderson. And you are a genius. Thank you, baby. I think you should start off every podcast. That energy was amazing. Oh, thanks. I, I like when you do it, but I'll do it sometime. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. But I wanted to do it intentionally today because I want to ask you, how was your week? Oh, hey, what was my week? It was very good. Mm-hmm. A lot of rain. It rained so much this week. Um, so I didn't get a chance to play golf as many times I as I knew wanted that's to. that's where we were going. But I definitely enjoyed spending that time with you. We got oh. a chance to go to the mall. I helped you shop you did. this week. You did. I didn't sit down and let you wander. I actually <laughs> went every place with you. You did. And I realized why you leave me at home. Because oh. I felt like you felt like I was hounding you, like I was on your trail going everywhere you were going. Or you just feel, I just felt a little pressure to hurry because I would imagine it's kind of boring. You know, you didn't do anything. You didn't say anything to make me feel this way. But in my mind, I'm like, I know he's bored and I can be indecisive. Like, "Mm, I like this jacket, but I don't like these pants. Let me go back over here and see if there's, I didn't want you to have to do that. But I helped you, didn't I? You did. You were very, very helpful. And I did not know that husbands, I mean, could go in dressing rooms. Yeah, I felt a little uncomfortable back there. (laughs) Because I felt like if somebody else would have walked out. That's what I was thinking. So yeah. like you could have your friend, your girlfriend out there that you come out of the dressing room, possibly in your bra and some jeans, right? right. You know, you're like, girl, how do these fit? So and that goes, I would have been mad if somebody's husband was sitting Leroy out there. Leroy just sitting right, right. there. Looking. Like, wait a minute. This the lady <laughs> section. So to me, following you around is just one of those small, insignificant marriage compromises Um, that makes, at least for this episode, and I think this is important, um, that makes marriage a dual inside job, Mm -hmm. right? That this, this thing that we have to do together, because neither one of us can do the work on this thing alone. Right. It's a joint inside job. It's a joint. I like that better. A joint inside job. It is. Because like I said, you didn't say anything. You didn't complain. You didn't sigh. You didn't do anything, no body, no body language that showed me I hated here. You were good. Um, it was just me. Like, I, I know that this is, I'm probably getting on this nerves. On no, you were not getting on my nerve. I enjoyed every second of it. And uh, as long as I don't have to do it all the time, I can enjoy it when I do it. <laughs> We, I could, yeah, I think I was I was a good time that yeah. day, right? Yeah, it was a good and time. We only went into like eight stores. Yeah, I could I have done it like easy eight. sixteen. Literally, I thought it was sixteen already. Wow, it was yeah. only eight. You know Literally, what? I counted sixteen <laughs> stores. I didn't even try on a lot of clothes. I didn't. I didn't put you through all of that. That's true. That's true. It was true. a good day. Well, I want to ask you because today we're talking about uh, marriage in a time where it seems as if. I don't want to use the word vast majority, but a great, great gaining majority of our society is literally allergic to commitment. I know. Just like, I want to get in, I want to get out, I want to do it how I want to do it. So just between you and me and all of our growth owners, does marriage still make sense? I think it depends on who you're talking to. Um, I see a lot of people who just have no plans of getting married and maybe it's the place that they're in in life at that particular time you know like I've, I've been there we've both been there we were like absolutely not not getting married um but life keeps life in mm. and you change your mind you meet Mr. Right or Mrs. Right whatever it is things happen that change the directive of life all the time but I do find that of the younger generation, like those 20 somethings are more, I'm I'm not into getting married. I don't care if I ever have kids. I don't think I want kids. They're in that space a lot. But I was talking to one young lady and she was like, if marriage is what I've seen and the examples of relationships that I've seen in my life, I don't want it. So- That makes sense. You know, if you're only seeing a certain kind of relationship that you find unhealthy or, you know, my mom's going to kill me. But I remember my sister and I told her and my dad, you know, they always said we struggled and we stayed together for you guys. And we did this for you guys. My sister and I were like, we have been grown for quite a long time. So now what? You know, I have a brother that was born when I was 18. 
So he's 18 years younger than me. I get it. Let Ty grow up. But now here y'all are still together and complaining. And it was all for us. But we had, my sister and I told him, like, honestly, I don't think you did us any favors because you didn't show us what a healthy marriage is. Mm. It wasn't healthy, you know, so we still walked away not knowing how to be a wife or a husband or, you know, what we were supposed to, what was a healthy marriage. So I understood when she, when this young lady was saying to me, like, the examples of marriage that I've seen makes me not want it. See, some people brag on the longevity of a marriage. Mm-hmm without realizing the health component of it. Like, it's, we've been married 20 years. Right. We've been married 30 years. But how many of those years were you absolutely miserable? And how many of those years did you want to leave? Now, but here's my perspective. My perspective is, is that if you look at marriage as a way of being content or as a median by which you achieve happiness, I think it's like looking for light, light in the dark. Mm-hmm. It's not there. It's not there. I think that in order for marriage to make sense, in order for us to do it properly, I think we have to realize that it's not uh, us being mad isn't a reason for a divorce. And us not being happy isn't a reason for divorce. I think that the young lady that you were talking about, if we were to dig deeper in there, and I don't know who you're talking about, don't need to know, but if we were to dig deeper, I think sometimes people who are in relationship crises sometimes parents share too much with their children. Oh, for sure. And now the children are viewing their future relationship Mm -hmm. based on their parents' current relationship. And if I assume that I'm going to encounter what you encountered, then it's easy for me to run away from it. But is it possible that I could have a different experience if I go into marriage differently than, say, my mom did or my father? Right. And also, what has she been told is correct? You know, like... You attend a lot of relationship seminars and and different things like that, those relationship retreats. People go to those all the time, and they'll come back with these two people that seem to be perfectly married for 20 years um, and want to tell you how to to live your life in a marriage and how you should, what you should be looking for and what you should do. Which I always think is a dangerous space because I've I've sat on some of those panels and sat and listened to sometimes a seasoned woman or man that has been married for a long time describe what the correct way to be married and the correct way to conduct yourself as a wife and a husband. And they're a bit warped or <laughs> just even dated or like, yeah, maybe that worked then. I don't think that's working now. So it's 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 kind of going with the times, too. Things are so, so different that you say this all the time. Like, you know, women used to stay at home a lot more. Um, our moms, my mom was like both. She was at home, but she also at work sometimes. It just depends on where we were, like if we really needed her and we were in that time of life or she needed to run us around and we had all these activities. She didn't have to work, but she she chose to. But it's like this generation and women nowadays are more out there, more career driven. Um, and the men kind of have to adapt to something different than what our fathers and our grandfathers taught us or showed us. I agree. But I do think that whether you get married in 2023 or whether you got married in 1913, one of the things that I know is universal is commitment. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just has to be the foundation of it. It doesn't matter if we live in the days when Henry Ford first introduced the car or in the days where Elon Musk has taken Nikola Tesla's technology and now we have electric vehicles. From that time to this time, in between the Flintstones and the Jetsons, commitment still works. And I just think that marriage is becoming harder because we, through artificial intelligence and and the, the differentiation of time, we don't have to commit like we used to. Okay, so what do you mean? Because... Commitment in 1913 is not the same definition of commitment in 2023. So explain what you mean. Yeah, I think that that is probably a part of the issue because it should be. Because when I say commitment, all I'm saying is 
I am committing to managing the original decision I made. I don't care what year it is. Mm. It doesn't matter if they're robots or Neanderthals. Commitment to my original decision, if I gave you my word. And so as a divorcee, as divorcees, what we're sitting here is why we always say we're experienced, right? I mean, uh, we're not experts, we're experienced. Mm -hmm. Because had I known then what I know now, marriage is not about a perpetual, blissful, happy state where every day is going to be Sunday and you're going to be smiling and you're always going to be in love and you're going to be holding hands in the park. And so what we've fallen victim to is watching the scripts on television and then getting upset when we don't see that scene unfolding in our personal lives. It's not going to always be happy. It's not going to... Your parents... They made a decision to stay together for you guys. To me, that isn't commitment. That's not the that's not the commitment. When they went in front of that preacher, they didn't say, We promise we're gonna stay together for the kids. They did not say that. They didn't. But I think that was their definition of commitment. Exactly. To never get divorced. Right. So, so so then if we change the definition of commitment or if we wrap our own idea around commitment. Then I think that if for marriage to be an inside job, then the two people have to sit down and say, what is our definition of commitment? Correct. What are right. we going to be committed to? So right now, you and I, we've never asked each other this question, right? So mm -hmm. we're committed to doing what? We're committed to loving each other and being patient with each other and committed to each other, um, communicating with each other through good, bad, uh, what... It's so funny you brought that up because even Lady Jakes, how she said how people are writing their own vows and changing up what the vows really are. She was like, no, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for, through sickness and in health. Say them vows, that's girl. What, <laughs> that's what we are committed to. And so anything, and this is what I believe, any commitment that two people make to stay together that's outside of those two isn't a commitment. That's good. Right? So we're going to, it's, it's. It's not sustainable. I shouldn't say it's not a commitment. It's not a sustainable commitment. Mm. Not not one that's going to give us the joy that we're looking for from this dual, dual inside job. You used the word joint. earlier, joint, joint inside mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we going to stay together because we have a business? We're going to stay together because we have children. One thing I said, I'm going to stay in the marriage because I don't want the church to fall apart. Right. Any time you make a commitment, that is outside of the union, your chances of surviving are less because there is nothing outside of me that's going to hold me when I'm ready to go. <laughs> mm, that's actually really good. I have a question. Okay. Do you think that shacking up has consequences? I do think shacking up has consequences. You're talking about cohabitating, correct? Wow. Shacking is absolutely an old people word. I know. But it, you knew what it was. Because I'm old. Living together without yeah. being married. That's what my mom would say, shacking up. Yeah, I mean, it's in the scripture, number one. Uh, but number two, let's just talk about the practical aspects of what joining your resources together without legalized contracts will do. A legalized contract is a marriage license. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if I move in with you... Mm -hmm. And you move in with me, and we have intimate relationships, and we do all the things that married people do. Well, if you go back to the scripture, remember when Jesus, his mother Mary and Joseph were together, the Bible says that they were espoused to be married. And based on their espousal to be married, they were already engaged, but not married. Jesus is now born. And in those days, Marriage was consummated by sexual intimacy, not at the altar. Okay. Okay. So that's that's where we first where we first see marriage at. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you couldn't live together because in those times the father had to give permission to the um, to the uh, man who came and said, "Can I have your wife?" Which is why at the altar, who gives this man to be married to this woman? I do. Right. Mm -hmm. So so if we're going to get together and we're going to act married and we're going to live married and we're going to put our money together and we're going to do all those things, then we're actually putting the cart before the horse. I think that we're already if we're marrying our stuff and we haven't married each other, 
I think the consequences is is that the stuff will always be before the people. What if we don't join stuff? Well, what then we then we break in another law because why come together? That are for together. this call shall the two come together and become one. If we're going to be together and keep our stuff separate, then you have to ask the question. The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart is also. No, no, no. I'm talking about the cohabitation thing. I'm talking about it. I'm if you don't get it. married and you move in with somebody, you don't, you, you know, it's it's like roommate situation. But you're learning each other. You're dating. You're figuring out, can I be with this person for the rest of my life? Because I will say... Moving in with somebody is a different version of some, of that person. You know what I mean? You get to know them a lot more intimately, not just sexually. I just mean, you know, are you messy? Are you, you know, different things like that. So if you keep everything separate, you move in together for the sake of learning each other or knowing if this is your, your person, are there consequences to that? Yeah, I think there are consequences, but I think that, again, you're putting the cart before the horse because yeah. if I got to find out if you're messy, if I'm going to stay in love, that's weak. Mm -hmm. If I got to find out whether or not uh, you use Dove, see, we're, if if I got to come in and find out all of those things as a way of finding out if you're my person, those are weak reasons to stay together. If my heart is wrapped up in yours and we are soulmates uh, or, or we are destined to be together me living with you shouldn't change um, how I view we should be together based on what I see about your house habits. Hmm. That's weak, in my opinion. It, I mean, I get it. We're getting a divorce because your socks is on the floor. See, those are all excuses, and I think it fits into this allergic commitment culture where we're always looking for a way out, and it could be something as small as you snoring or because those are the only things you find out when you live with somebody. So is living together a sin? Hmm. And that's the age old question. Um, I don't think that God has a problem with two people living together. I think that by definition is called a roommate. But I do know in 1 Corinthians, it talks about fornication being a sin and fornication is sex outside of marriage. So if those two people can live in the same house and sleep in the same bed, and get out of the shower and sleep to, next to each other with no clothes on and wow, stay disciplined. Specific. Yeah. Well, then I think that there you go. I think you're pleasing God. But if you get out of that shower and you find yourself being undisciplined, uh -huh. then the question is, are you putting yourself in a compromising position to break a rule? Right. That I'm you sorry. Could easily I'm laughing because you, you referenced getting out of the shower twice. It's That's pretty much where it's going to happen. <laughs> it ain't, you ain't going to be thinking about it when you're mad at each other, taking the kids right. to school, but it's going to be, so you put yourself in that environment, you put yourself um, in temptation. a disadvantage, temptation, yeah. lest ye fall. So then again, does God have a problem with us living together? Not if we're disciplined. Hmm. Okay. Well, you said it. So when yeah. people go shacking up. Try, no, they won't be shacking because shacking. When your mama said shacking, uh -huh. she wasn't talking about sleeping, sleeping. in separate rooms and and uh, and you know, yeah, you know shacking got some other stuff to go with it. So okay. if you're actually shacking, shacking, then that's yeah. a no no. Yeah, you shacked. But if you're <laughs> I shacked, <laughs> I can't resist. Man. I can't resist. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was all on me. I that's like, so. Give me a kiss on your neck, baby. I, I wow. <laughs> no, it's so good. I can't hold it. Oh, it, it. No, it's good. I'm sorry, babe. No, now, if I had done that, oh, I would be no. a punishment. I'm sorry, babe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you know people are like, you know, they want to have sex and they want to you know people well women in general have some women have a problem with being called a helper because that technically makes you, you know, like second in command. Um, and your your <laughs> husband is supposed to lead you. He's supposed to be the leader of your household. But the title of helper sometimes being the supporting role is is overwhelming for some women. They just don't like the title. Man, I just I just don't know. I could never imagine what it is like to have to be female in this institution of relationship. Mm. That that's got to be hard because when I hear that, I don't hear negativity. I hear the scripture literally saying it's not good for man to be alone, so he created him a help me. Right. Right. So helper to me 
doesn't sound like second class citizens. So I would have to defer to you to figure out why would a woman perceive that to not be, which I think after commitment being the first most important thing in relationship, maybe support and partnership being number two. Why does a woman not hear support and partnership when she hears help? I personally hear support and partnership. Like okay. that's what I hear. But I do hear a lot of women say, well, why, you know, I'm the help. Mm-hmm. They just stop there. Okay, the help. Yeah. Not a helper or the helper. Right, which is Understood. what the scripture says, right? Yes, the ma'am. helper mm-hmm. or a helper. A helper. A helper. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think a lot of women just hear help. I mean, there, it's a lot of uber sensitive folks these days, as we know, but it's it makes them feel. I've had this conversation with women before where it's like, I'm nobody's help. You know, I'm coming in 50 50 or nothing at all. But I think that is exactly what the scripture is saying. Like, you are the support, you are the help, you are, but so are, so is the husband. You know no, what I mean? No, we get ready to empower you now because I think that that is a misappropriation of the actual term because the word helper is a military term. Mm. It is not it is not a term of weakness. Remember it, the 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 Bible it was Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, but when you translate that into English, it doesn't mean subservient. It means helper. It's 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 the Bible says that man and woman was given dominion over the earth. So being a partner and being together and and being a king and a queen, that's that's actually God language. I just think that sometimes it get misconstrued cuz God didn't create women to be obedient like animals to masters. He created women to be helpers. Why was she the help? Because he was here first. He was here. He had dominion over the earth, but it wasn't complete until she showed up. Hmm. You see? We need to find it that way, and I'm sure a lot of them will have. (laughs) That's the truth. So then we look at definitions. Are we talking about definitions or are we talking about people's perceptions? Because those are not the same thing. Um, It's definitely the perspective of women. Uh, not Let me not say all women, because like I said, I don't read it that way. Mm-hmm. But I have had conversations with many women who do. They're just very, you know, I'm an independent woman. I stand on my own. I'm strong. Yeah. I'm confident. I don't need a man. You know, you have those women that will take this helper word and make it, you know, a negative thing. Man, let me tell you something. If a man said, I'm strong, I'm independent, I don't need no woman, There would be a million rumors about that guy. (laughs) A woman stands up and says, I don't need a man. She gets Mm -hmm. applauded. Why is that? Because I think we need each other. I agree. Yeah. That's absolutely true. We do need each other. It is a complete perspective of just certain people that feel, you know, I don't know. It's just this, you do feel good as a woman being independent and being able to stand on your own. It's a great feeling, yes. But if you find a man that comes into your life as a partner, as, for example, us, okay, it will be times that we just fill in each other's deficits, right? So you might be leading one day and I might be leading the next, depending on what life happens, what what happens in life that that week, that day. So it's just coming in as a support system, as a helper to fill in those gaps of where your other person yeah. isn't quite full. I, I accept that. I receive that. So I think what you probably just did for a lot of the men who are watching today is you've given context. Because I think we could be using the same words. And this is, this is why communication and commitment and partnership and, and relationships is so important. Because we could be using the same words and talking about two totally different concepts. So when you said women hear help and think weak, I'm thinking like, I hear help and like, come on. Mm -hmm. Like I hear empowerment. I hear we can do this. I hear uh, that we got to share this load. I hear you are what I'm not. Mm -hmm. That's the only purpose for having a partner is for them to bring to the table what you don't have strength in because that's the purpose of partnership, that we together can do this. And I alone, by asking you to be my partner, it is an admission that I cannot do it by myself. When I walk down the altar with you, what I was saying to the world is, from this step until I die, I'm I'm unable and incapable of completing the rest of my life alone. Mm -hmm. 
That's exactly what it says. But you're right. It's a partnership. Mm. And again, it, you're describing what I'm saying is filling you in your heart, yeah, and so, filling the de- filling the deficits. You fill mine, I fill yours. That's help. So that's growing. Absolutely, that's growing. Absolutely. And so if it's an inside job individually, it's a us job together. Then can we say then? All right, a, if you want to have call it a joint inside, a job. joint inside job. So then, the three things that our audience can take away from this so far is: is if you're going to make it make sense, you got to commit, define what support and partnership is, and then third, do some individual personal growth. Right, and define what commitment is for the two of you, because you know that doesn't mean the same thing for everybody. Yeah. So when I when I walked down the aisle with you. Mm-hmm. and we were going to say our marriage vows, I was literally saying that this is my partner and I cannot do anything from this point forward, or I should not, without this partner. I was admitting that you were necessary for the rest of my journey because partnerships, subconsciously, it's the admittance that I can't do it alone hmm. or, or at least I shouldn't be doing it alone. Either way, because there, you know, there are people who are financially... Uh, fiscally able, but they still take loans from the bank, right? So it's not it's not that I can't, but is it a, is it the smart thing, right? Am I working hard? Am I working smart? And I think that partnerships are a way of working together to accomplish a task where you. I think you said commitment mm-hmm. is defined. It's defined, yes. Partnership and support is defined, and growth is defined. Now, let me just say this on the growth, and I want to hear what you think. I think that in relationships marriage especially, to make it make sense, that you have to let people grow and you got to stop trying to grow them. Right, right. The fix them thing. Ooh, that fixing people it's thing. It's not a thing. It really isn't a thing. I, I just talk I, about that. I, I talk about this in, in my book too. You is sound that, like an author. I like that. I know. I like that when you say, I hey, talk I talked about, about this, this in my book. book. I felt super smart saying that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I talk about it because I was that person. Like I got married in my previous relationship thinking that it was going to fix things and that, oh, you know, he's going to change this because we got married or he's going to act differently because we got married. Mm. That is not true. It's not realistic. And it's not my job to fix those things about the person that I'm married to. I can't fix you. I can't fix my ex, I couldn't, you know, that's just unrealistic thinking. So that fix some thing is is just a myth. It's absolutely a myth. And it's how, you know what I mean? Like, what are the tools that you're going to use to fix that person? So I think the best case scenario uh, to not have to fix somebody is to just marry somebody, um, first of all, who you're absolutely prayerful about, right? Not somebody mm-hmm. who give you the butterflies. You know, you got to pray they gotta about it. They got to give me that too. Though. Yeah, but you I, gave me I agree. I agree with that. Let me retract that. You should get the butterflies. But I also think that you should take them to your mama house and see if flies come. Wow. I think that you got to let other people <laughs> sniff them. I think, I just believe this. I who don't think- other, Who qualifies as the other people? Anybody you trust, a mother, mm. a spouse, a mentor. Somebody should look at that person before you make, your final decision, because love is blind. That's true, and it make you do dumb stuff. And frustration got twenty twenty. So you be you be in love and can't see. When you get frustrated, it's amazing. You can hear and see everything when you frustrated. That's true. That is so true. You hear the person breathing on everything. the other side of the room. <laughs> I know. I just irritated everybody on a microphone but that's by breathing. True. Like everything irritates you. Like, oh, I can't stand how that person walk. Yeah. So best case scenario, after you get through all of that. You, your your match is not somebody who's strong where you're strong. Your match is actually somebody who's strong where you're weak. Mm, that's so true. You are everything I am not. And marrying you prevents me from having to try to be it. At best, I learn from you and improve in the areas of my weaknesses. But all I do is I focus on my strengths and I become stronger in my strengths. Right, right. So right, because you can now do that because you know I got your back. Because you got my back. That's so good. You got my back. So now I can go focus on my strengths instead of yeah. having to be marginal and average at everything. I can be real good at three things mm-hmm. because my wife is good at the other three. That's good, babe. 
I never thought about it like that, but that is absolutely true. Like, you're good at all the talking, so I can just sit and be quiet. I like it. Well, you know, I think the other dangerous part of uh, marriage making sense is when people um, exact marriage as a transactional tool mm. to advance their career or to advance their goal. Or their finances. Or their finances, because yeah. the problem is, is if you marry me uh, to extend your reach, then where do I fit after you reach what you were going after? Right. Right. I was I was looking at something, one of these talk shows, and it was a man saying he was looking for a woman to grow his business. Like I he wanted that. to marry a woman. He did not care what that. kind of woman. He was like, listen, he had, he had come up with a list of all the reasons why this marrying this woman that he didn't have at the moment mm -hmm. would help him financially, career-wise, build his credit. Like he had all these things that had nothing to do with love. He's like, you know, I'll eventually get there probably. Like was not a part of his list wow. at all. It was about his gain and where he was going and his goals that he had for himself and how marriage was supposed to knock see, all see, his things. But then you know what that does? Out, that makes the person boxes. a tool and not a goal. Absolutely. She was a complete transaction, whoever she was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he had it all set and planned. And But it's a lot of people that do that. You know, it's a lot of people. It's about... We can become this thing together. And where once you reach that, if you ever do, then what happens to the relationship? Mm -hmm. Where are you? Are you miserable? Or is it is it a peak? Does it cap off at when I check all the boxes on the list and I've accomplished it now? Do I still want you? Are we even do we even love each other? Like what is that like? What is that transactional marriage? Like mm. I can speak for men, and I can tell you, men don't like to be used. Well, neither do women, right? I'm, and I'm not speaking for women. I'm speaking yeah. for men, and yeah. I know that we we have that in common. But I can speak for men. The one thing that most men walk around uh, with this intrinsic fear is: Am I being used? Hmm. It's an intrinsic fear. I don't know where it derives from. I don't know if it's from our adolescence. I don't know if it comes. I don't know where it comes from, but I do know that innately men are afraid to be used. How how do women feel? Like, do women feel that? Absolutely. I mean, especially this new age woman who, you mm -hmm. know, has a lot going for herself, is independent and, and career driven and, you know, worked really hard to get where she is. You are absolutely. I mean, you'll hear women say, oh, I'm not going to date anything beneath my, you know, my tax bracket. Mm. Because I think the fear of being used, the fear of carrying someone, the fear of taking care of someone is is a thing, unfortunately, because a lot of times you could be building, help build that man up to be the president of the United, you know, whatever it is. And you guys go on this journey together. I want to build with somebody. You know, maybe that somebody might have less than me, but if we build together, it's ours. Mm. That's not everybody's mindset all the time. You know, like sometimes it's just they got to be up here before I get there cuz I'm trying to, you know, stay on the level or get up there with them. It's a transaction. But, you know, when it's cultural to have a an arranged marriage or something like that. It's not necessarily transactional between the two. It's maybe transactional between the families, the families or the culture itself. I always wonder, I haven't met anybody who's had one of those arranged marriages, but I wonder like, do you grow to love that person? Do you, are you raised to love that? Like if you know, the parents know at two years old, these two are getting married. Hmm. Do they raise them together to just, how do you stop it from being like a brother sister relationship? And I just that's right. the homie. I don't. How do I don't you, even know the answer to crazy. that question. Yeah. I do know that what you did is you just opened up the fact that you know in the grow zone there is a global audience, and the the time we give a solution to a problem, we create a problem. Create a whole new one <laughs> in another area because right. here we are Americans with this freedom, and then talking to people. Um, in other countries who have to go through this arrangement, I do know that no matter what happens, once we do get together, I do know that we have she to define. No, I'm <laughs> no, we have to define commitment. We have to define what help is. 
Absolutely. And we have to define where growth is. And let me just ask you, because I know we got to be done, but you just said she to help. But isn't it true that sometimes relationships struggle because we don't communicate where we need to help? Right. Because I'm okay being your help, babe. Oh, uh, listen, I can tell you where I need to help. Absolutely. I'll tell we you, I'll say, babe, that. I need help right here. Yeah. And before I know it, I look up and that thing is done because I'm always in need of help right. in the areas of my weaknesses because those are the areas where you have strength. And here's how I define strength, the area that you have patience in. Mm, that's very true. Right? That's very, very true. Because one of the natures of weakness is I get irritated in this exercise. Well, is it is it the exercise or is it my weakness? Because right. I'm up here curling 25s and my arms are And burning. I'll be like, let me have that. I got Let me get that. You. That's light work. I got that. Right. Let me get it. Now, I'm, now you're freeing me up to go lift something on my level. See? See, that's why you're the genius of this. No, I'm not a genius, babe. Pretty I think geniusy. we are we. making it make sense together. And I got to get that word again. Joint. Joint. Relationship? No, it's a joint inside job. Joint inside job. Joint I got to put that job. in my vocabulary. I know. Is so that marriage correct? is joint a joint inside job. inside job. Growth in marriage. Yes. Is a joint inside job. And I think it's consistent. Job. Ooh, it's, that's a good one. It's consistent. It never stops. You are continuing to grow. It is never going to end. Well, let me say this as we wrap that up. You remember when we went and took our staff out to eat? And we, it was our deacon and deaconesses, so it was mm-hmm. um, uh, some uh, seasoned saints, as we like to call them seasoned around here. Seasoned saints. And um, we were sitting at the table, and we had an older lady that was nearly, I think at that time, she was in her mid-80s, mm-hmm. and her and her husband, how long did they say they were married? I feel like they said 60. 60-some some years. years. And she said, baby, let me give you and first lady some advice. She mm-hmm. said, number one. If y'all going to make marriage make sense, get that I and me out of your vocabulary and put some we and some us. You remember she said she that? She did. She said, get the I and you and we and us. And then she said, this man that I've been married to 60 some years has been nine different people. Mm-hmm. And I just learned how to be married to all different versions. Yeah. All and I thought them. that's how you make it make sense. Loving somebody and having the willingness to love the current state mm. and not hold your love back for some futuristic state of a person that may never come. Amen. Amen. That was good. Listen, thank you all so much for being with us in the Grow Zone. I'm glad that I'm married to you. I'm so glad I'm married to you. And I'm glad that we, we figured a out job. a way to make it make sense. Each other. All right. We <laughs> love y'all. We'll see you next time.